Well, good evening. Welcome to tonight's meet and greet. My name is Allison Lauer. I'm the executive director of the Florida Kiwanis Foundation, and we're so excited to have you all here tonight with us. Like I said, this is our monthly meet and greet. It is a 30-minute phone call that we focus on young children priority one. We ask special guest speakers to come and speak with us. We do a tight introduction and um, we do a presentation and then we take time to have some Q&A, which is really nice. And we'll finish right at seven. So without any further delay, I would like to invite a very special guest. We have Winnie Holland. She is a past president of the Florida Kiwanis Foundation, an incoming trustee um, in one of our divisions. And we are so excited that she'll be back with us. She is going to introduce our guest speaker tonight. So Winnie, would you do us the honor? Yes, thank you, Allison. It's nice to be here. And it's a, my honor and privilege to be able to introduce Dolores Mortimer. Dolores has been working for more than 25 years in mental health counseling and uh, guidance in the schools and the public and private sector, as well as private counseling. And she started House of Mercy and Encouragement in 2007. Mm -hmm. And um, as a memorial or as a um, an encouragement as, after she had a tragedy. So she turned a tragedy into something very positive. We, at House of Mercy and Encouragement, she does, um, we do uh, therapy. I'm, I'm working there now. That's why I keep saying we. <laughs> um, and it's a real privilege. We uh, do children from the age of three and up. And uh, she's, uh, uh, Dolores is a certified play therapist and supervisor, and she's going to explain to you about play therapy, and we also do adults. So it's a wonderful honor for me to be able to be here tonight, and please enjoy um, the expertise of Dolores because she's an outstanding and wonderful person. And I just like to say one more thing. I met Dolores as a result of Kiwanis, mm -hmm. and Kiwanis in this region is a big supporter of the House of Mercy and Encouragement. So this is another blessing that I've gotten from Kiwanis membership. So, Dolores. Oh, well, thank you. And, and it's, it is more than a blessing to have Winnie here with us. Um, she's had 30 years experience or more of, of mental health therapy. And, um, and uh, you know, with COVID, our numbers are rising. And uh, she decided to come and give us a hand. And so she she's absolutely wonderful with the children. She fits right in, good sense of humor, which we all need. <laughs> and it's really nice to have her here. So um, so this is just a quick little presentation. I'm, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about it. Sometimes I use it for play therapy trainings, but um, at least it'll give you a good idea of, you know, what our, um, what our facility is like and what we do here, okay? So, um, so it's called play therapy. It's more than just fun, and it's a, and it's a, it's, it's a, an honor to be able to tell you about it. So this is the House of Mercy and Encouragement, and we do um, individual um, and family counseling, play therapy, um, tutoring, because a lot of times we're dedicated to providing social, emotional, um, and mental health. Um, uh, therapy for children and families. And so the children that we have, a lot of times they're ADHD, they could be on the autism spectrum, they could be um, experiencing family relationship difficulties, death, divorce in the family, adjustment disorders, blended families. Um, we do, uh, we really help a lot of uh, relative caregivers, especially grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. And so, um, so we try to help the families as best we can with the um, mental health and emotional support that they need. So this is our waiting area where you see like the little books and the, um, that's the front of our building and our waiting area. This is our activity room. Our activity room is at where we're speaking from right now but it is a group room. During COVID, we couldn't uh, do groups. And so, but we did groups on Zoom and that was really kind of interesting. What we did was um, through the help of 
of um, our donations, we were able to purchase um, books, um, like a second set of books of, of a lot of the things that we use for children, whether it's impulse control or divorce or listening, paying attention. We have all kinds of books, we call it bibliotherapy, that we read to young children and they can help identify their own problems within the um, structure of the book. And so we would deliver the books um, to the homes and it, with the books, we would also deliver art materials to reinforce the lesson. So, um, so for example, just now I just, I just had a, um, a student here and she's um, going from fifth to sixth grade. And I was working on self-esteem with her. We read a little story called The Crack Pot. And it was uh, about a, a, a pot that felt um, belittled because he had a crack in it and he was next to a pot that was perfect. And so anyway, so we talked about that. We talked about self-esteem, things like that. And then we did an, a follow-up art project. We took clay, she made a pot, she painted it, she put flowers in there and she had a, a beautiful, um, I guess, so, uh, art piece of artwork that she took with her um, and to remind her of the story and that we're all special and unique in, in some way. So, so during the pandemic, we did uh, let them keep their art materials and then we just asked for the book back so that we could use it again. So, okay. Um, this next room is our playroom. So this is our play therapy room. We use this with children um, three through uh, five years of, uh, not three through five, three years old through, um, well, really sometimes up through 12 years old. It just depends on where the child is emotionally. But we, um, we have a section for puppets. We have, um, and I think that might be the next um, slide. Yeah, so we have two houses because sometimes children go between two houses. And so we have two houses, we have a hospital, we have a school uh, classroom. And so the children can play out um, different scenarios what is important in their life. And so we say everything has meaning and purpose. And so they may not play out exactly the thing that happened, um, um, say in the case of trauma, um, but uh, we learn to look for, we look at facial expressions, body language. We look at um, the words that the children are saying. We look at repeated themes, whether it's themes of um, loss or, whether it's themes of fear or whatever. So we look for repeated themes and um, we listen to what they say. And uh, one of the basic premises of, of play therapy is children know where they need to go in order to heal. And so that would be the non-directed play therapy. And so we have this room and um, the children can choose whatever um, they are attracted to because again, everything has meaning and purpose. You could have uh, two boys that are five years old with the same problem, you know, behavior problems at school or whatever, but they may go to a different area and they're attracted to different things, but they are uh, working through um, and coming to some res resolution of their problems. And usually um, metaphorically, we can tell, you know, what they're, what they're playing out. Um, so let's see the next one. Okay, um, this just shows a little bit more of the house and things like that. And um, I'm gonna go to the next one. This is our beach room. We call this the beach room. It's a quiet room and it's, um, it's for families. Uh, so we may have family sessions or it may be for individual couples. Sometimes, uh, you know, we're working with the children. We find out that, you know, there's kind of issues going on with them. Um, the relationships or whatever. And so we we may do couples or individuals, sometimes parents need help themselves. Um, this is our sand tray room. Love this room. A lot of kids love this room. And so there's, I don't know if you can really tell, but there's two sand trays there. One has green sand in it and the other one has white sand in it. And, and the white sand is moon sand. So you can mold it to, to make walls or, 
um, uh, volcanoes or whatever. Um, and the green sand is very fine, very soft. And these are a wide variety of um, just, we call them miniatures, but there's buildings, there's animals, there's people, there's princesses, there's, there's um, all kinds of, uh, I guess, careers, you, you could say, you know, farmers and, and firemen and things like that. And, and so um, the children will make stories in the sand. And so we may say something like I had an autistic uh, teenager last night. And, and so one of the things I asked him to do, and his mom was in the room, um, was um, make something, you know, in the back, towards the back, um, without saying anything, because I want you to really focus on what you're doing. So you don't have to tell me the story right now, but um, make something from your past. It could be from a long time ago, but just something, it's a, it could be something happy or sad or nothing. It could just be a vacation you went in. Um, and in the middle, put something from the present. And then at the front of the sand tray, what does your future look like? Well, he made the most exquisite, I can't even tell you. I mean, this, this stuff is so powerful, it's really amazing. Um, but he went back to when he was eight years old and was in a very bad car accident. I would have never known that if I didn't ask him to make some stories in the sand. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we, we focus on the immediate behavior or whatever it is that they're doing and we get lost in that, but we have to realize that whatever they experience, um, is very important to how they're acting now. So we say that all behavior has meaning and purpose. And so when I see a child throw a tantrum or whatever, um, I know that there's something behind that, you know? And maybe it's just that they're angry. So, um, so when, I, uh, when I do this as a, as a, as a training, I ask, I ask the people, and you may want to think about this yourself because this is so interesting. What was your favorite game or play activity when you were growing up? Describe where you were and what you did, about how old you were, what was your favorite person to play with? Um, and looking back now, what do you think you learned from the playing your favorite game or activity? So, do I have a volunteer? <laughs> Does anybody want to say what their favorite play activity was when they were growing up? Okay. My favorite play activity when I was growing up was um, work playing with dolls. And I especially liked, I especially liked dolls that were sick. Aww. <laughs> because then I could take care of them. So, um, so that was a very nurturing theme. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another theme, nurturing. And yeah. then, then I worked in public health and now I'm working at, and working with children at, well, I taught school initially, but it was really something that I always enjoyed because I always babysat a lot of kids and stuff like that. But I really like playing with dolls, especially, you know, if, if they were sick or I pretended that they were sick. Yeah. <laughs> so I could help them. Yeah, and, and when I think of what I used to enjoy playing with, um, you, you know, it's like, it's in my playroom today, you know? <laughs> and and I remember sitting on the front steps and, and the little girl across the street had a box of like farm animals. And so my sister and myself and the girl across the street, we used to pick different, and then we would set up these farms and we would visit, visit each other and everything. So. <laughs> So I have animals in my in my playroom and in my sand tray room. And sometimes I'll say to them, if you could be any animal, what would you be? And there again, there's meaning and purpose to everything. So um, so we do get some very interesting answers with that. And then the other thing is, is that that family dynamics, a lot of times I'll say, choose um, an animal to be your dad, one to be your mom, one to be your brother, one to be yourself. And, you know, sometimes they may take a really fierce looking animal, like a tiger with his mouth wide open or something, um, or a monkey. And, and I'm just thinking of things that's happened in the past, but the, 
fierce tiger was a dad who always yelled. And then um, the, the monkey was his uh, brother who was always playing around. So anyway, it was, it, it, you just learn so much in a fun way. And what I tell parents is I don't, I don't question children. There's no need to question them. You know, um, uh, we go by, I, I, I call it the drip method, describe, reflect, imitate, praise. Describe, reflect, imitate, praise. So you don't have to ask them any questions. And, and, um, and that's very important because questions can be leading and we don't wanna lead the child. They know where they need to go in order to heal. So um, Plato said you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. Um, because when you uh, talk with a child, if you just do talk therapy, they would tell you what maybe their parents told told them to say to you, and I can always tell that. And or they might say what they think you want to hear, or whatever. So I, I mean, just just play, and we just learn so much from that. Um, through the manipulation of toys, Hiram Gannat was a psychiatrist who worked with children. Um, the child um, uh, can show more adequately than through words how he feels about himself and the significant persons and events in his life. Um, imagination is more important than knowledge was Albert Einstein. And this was a little boy that I worked with. He, I was a guidance counselor at a school. I'll just say this real quick. I, and I know I just have a limited amount of time, but um, I was a guidance counselor at a school. And he was a very intelligent boy. He, um, he was in fourth grade. And um, sometimes children who are gifted and very intelligent, sometimes they lack their social skills or they have problems um, with emotional regulation. And so that, that was this little guy. And so he was out on the playground, something went wrong. He was crying, so they sent him to me, the guidance counselor. And so <clears throat> this happened to be at a, um, uh, at a Catholic school. And so it was the season of Lent. I don't know if anybody knows what Lent is, but it's where you're supposed to you know, sacrifice or whatever, 40 days of Lent before Easter. But anyway, so <laughs> Bobby says to me, um, and, and the worst part is he was telling me all these things that were going wrong on the playground. And the worst part is, is the teacher said that this morning she picked the, the um, activity out of the bucket. And I guess it was supposed to be some sacrifice or something extra that you do during Lent. And it said, don't play today. And then he said, and playing for me is like a massage is for someone with back problems. It helps me relieve the tension from the stress of the day. And so I said, Oh, Bobby, that's so profound. Can you please repeat that so Mrs. Mortimer can write this down? And so he, he did. And it's isn't it uh, uh, amazing that, you know, we think, and I, I think I was even talking to Winnie. I don't know what I did with this kid, but the mom wrote me this really nice email, you know? I, I said, I don't really feel like I did anything. But, you know, if you can come to a safe place where you are accepted, where you are nurtured, where um, you know that you can say anything and you don't have to worry about what you're saying, um, then it is a stress relief, a, a stress relief experience. So, um, so uh, this is just you know a quick little thing about that stress in children can um, can last a lifetime. Um, experiences are built into our bodies in significant adversity. And life can produce biological memories that lead to lifelong impairments in both physical and mental health. And so uh, this just shows that there's family stress, school stress, and just um, general stress. I can't, can't see it because, um, because there's pictures in the way there, but I, I can't see the last column. But anyway, um, and then underneath is different signs and symptoms that we look for children with stress. Sometimes and one of the most interesting ones for me is somatic complaints, which is a kid will come to you and say, oh, my arm hurts or my leg hurts or my whatever. And their leg really doesn't hurt and their arm really doesn't hurt. They're hurting inside and we have to identify what it is. And so, you know, um, you know, sometimes kids at school go to 
go go to the to to the front office because they have stomach aches every day. And so a lot of times we have to take a look at at their physical uh, well being as well. And then the the only thing I want to say about adversity early in life is I've seen it a lot over the course of um, the many years that. I don't like to say how many years because then you'll think I'm an old lady. But anyway, that over the course of the many years that I've been doing this, is that um, yes, when there is when there is terrible neg neglect and uh, abuse at a very young age, um, it is very hard to re to reverse that. And so sometimes we call that reactive attachment disorder. And so it's children who have not had that proper attachment when they were infants <clears throat> or toddlers even. So, and that's just a little bit more about brain development and, and why that is so uh, as far as this. Um, there are social stages of play that we look for a lot of times. Um, solitary play is is just like the, the first picture here where a baby is just totally ignoring everything around them and very focused on just one thing, solitary play. Um, sometimes they might even be just playing with their foot or their hands or whatever. Um, parallel play is like the second picture. That's two kids playing together, not even really interacting with each other. Um, but they do enjoy playing next to each other. Associative play is the next one. And that's where like if they are in the sandbox, the one little girl might... Um, uh, you know, give her shovel to the other little boy. So associative plays, they're just beginning to learn that there's somebody next to them. And so they're going to, um, they're going to share their materials. Cooperative play is um, like imaginative play, creating roles and working towards a common good. So, you know, that would even be like the, the um, this type of play um, where they're all playing with the parachute. Um, and the reason this is important is because sometimes, um, like for example, I had a, a, a six-year-old um, and she would come to the playroom and she was at the stage of solitary play. She had no idea that I was even in the room. She just totally was absorbed by herself. And then, um, so what I did was I just played with whatever she was playing next to her. I didn't necessarily say anything. But what I was trying to do is get her from solitary play to parallel play. So I would just play next to her. And then I knew she was getting better when one day she handed me, we were playing with Play-Doh and she handed me something. She handed me a, you know, so it's little things like that that we look for, that we know that the child is growing and, 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 um, really, and then eventually, you know, um, she did play with me and we, you know, made cakes together and stuff like that. So um, so anyway, that's basically it. Now, what about, I'm like, how do I share that? Just look at it. Do I close this no, here? No, no, no. 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 Sorry, technical difficulties here. I, I just wanted to show you a piece of artwork that a child did. Oh, oh, can you see this? Oh, oh yes. Okay. So this, I just asked the boy, I said, um, just uh, paint a picture of how you're feeling. Now, this boy um had uh, I would say was he was Baker acted from school so they Baker acted him I didn't know him at the time the mother called me while he was in the hospital um heard about the house of mercy through a friend whatever and so um and so I said just paint a picture of how you feel he was deeply depressed I don't know if you can tell that or not from this but he was deeply depressed uh worked with him for a little while I said okay well, draw a picture of how you feel now. Very insignificant, a small black dot. Uh, and I said to Winnie, not getting very far as you this. You know, well, at least there was a lot of white in the picture, but still he was an insignificant dot. And so then just recently, um, I said, do you want to take the depression inventory, which is, you know, questionnaire. I said, do you want to take the depression inventory or would you rather draw how you're feeling right now or paint? How you're feeling right now? And he goes, well, I'd rather paint. And I said, okay, well then, you know, just paint how you're feeling right now. Now, he, and how he explained this is, I have a lot of mixed up feelings, but I'm happy sometimes. I'm really happy sometimes. And sometimes 
I, I feel sad. And, and that to me was so much better from, you know, going to all black to an insignificant black dot to something that has color and that's bright and that he's able to say, sometimes I am happy and sometimes I'm not. So anyway, that's just kind of gives you an example of how play therapy works. So does anybody have any questions? I do. Okay. I always, I always don't have make it hard for me, Dan. Don't make it hard. Don't let it be a hard question. <laughs> it, it's not a hard question, but in the news today, you hear all, all many things about uh, mental issues and how do I, well, I know how I would do it. How would uh, my fellow Kiwanians from around the Florida district help kids through their emotional um, and mental issues? Is there, is there a, a resource that, that individuals can contact? I don't, I'm not sure how to ask the question, but how can it's we probably help? Probably community mental health. I mean, because I don't know everybody lives, if it's state, if this is statewide, right. everybody lives in a different area and whatever, but, but every county has community mental health. So I, I guess yeah. I would start there and just ask what programs they have for children and, and, and then, you know, um, and then find out, you, you know, uh, what, what is available there. Not everybody I have to say is an expert in, um, in uh, play therapy, I, but I've been taking classes since the late 80s, believe it or not. I constantly take classes in play therapy and there's always more and more to learn. Um, and some people say they're using play therapy, but they're really not using play therapy because they've never had a course in play therapy. So how can you say, I mean, because they have a couple of toys in their office or whatever, but that's not, to me, that's insulting because I've spent lots of money in training and lots of, you know, time and things like that. And, it, and it's like learning a different language. It really is, is what you, if you really, so they could go on <laughs> that to be said, uh, the Association for Play Therapy. And if they put it where, wherever their zip code is or whatever, if they put that in, then they will get professional help with people who are trained in and are members of the American Associ of the Association for Play Therapy. And that, that actually is international too, so. And, and this, this follows up. So the early, or er, the intervention, for lack of a better term, takes place, the better their lives will be as well as those around them. So again, catching them early is the key. Early, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Really early because you know what? They, they say that the, the brain is flexible. And uh, <laughs> I, I actually, um, skipped over that one, I think. Um, but maybe it was this one. Okay. So I skipped over that one, but this says the brain is shaped the most during the first 10 years of life between 10 and 18 months, 10 and 18 months, a baby's emotions are developed. Emotions are closely connected with long-term memory. Children who are ignored or not nurtured will not fully develop in all areas of the brain. And that is so true. A lot of times they say children who are, you know, even toddlers who are abused um, emotionally, physically, whatever, um, they cannot tell the difference. And a lot of times we have to work on that too, between a person's affect, when a person is smiling and when a person is frowning, they, they can't tell that because that's a part of the um, emotional part of the brain that was affected during abuse. And Dan, I'd just like to add that, you know, Kiwanians are in the schools and reading to the kids in the preschools and in the daycares all the time. And one of the most important things that they can also do is they can listen. Just listen. Oh, my goodness. You can learn so much by listening. And if they feel uncomfortable, then they should do something about it. They should they should say something to the teacher or they should say, you know, say something about, you know, something that happened. And, you know, I always believe that, you know, if, if it doesn't feel right in your stomach, then, you know, something's not right. But Kiwanians are great with look, working with young kids and, um, and listening is, is really, really important. 
Winnie, you brought up a great point there about listening and the opportunity that we have to during reading. You know, that young boy that you shared the story about with the end with the picture, it reminds me of this book called The Color Monster. Oh, uh, yeah, we have that one. Yeah. It's a it's great book. It really is. Um, we do conscious discipline in our house and um, emotional intelligence. My husband's an educator. So we're always uh-huh. trying to find great books that, you know, can help. Um, with impulse control or identifying emotions or other, you know, important pivots for our toddler. What are some books that either one of you would recommend for our Kwanians to we read in their schools to we have start to go introduce that? Our, oh my we have God, a we library. Have we have lots we of have stuff. Wonderful books here. Yeah, we have, we have wonderful. Books. And it, I tell you something. It's it's amazing. Even when the kids are twelve and fourteen read a book to them it's amazing how engaged they are Mm -hmm. and how they will talk to you about what they felt about what happened in the book no but like if their family if their family is disrupted or you know they're I just did one on a girl that's moving because she's got she had a lot of trepidation about moving from her apartment into a house and and you know, I, w- I was a little nervous because it was kind of, it, the pictures were a little bit young. She was totally engaged throughout the whole reading of the mm-hmm. book. Because, you know, sometimes we read children's books and we say, wow, I really like, you know, like The Giving Tree or something like that. I really like that book. That book has a lot of meaning to mm-hmm. it. And so sometimes when parents are like first getting divorced and their children are young or something like that, they'll say, well, you know, how am I going to explain this? And I said, well, what I want you to do is I want you to take this this book home or take a picture of it and order it um, and uh, read the book yourself first, because sometimes we learn how to explain things to children through children's books, you know? And so, and they say, and then if you like the book, you can read it to your child or just read the parts of the book that you think are appropriate for your situation. But I do think adults can learn a lot (laughs) through children's books and how to explain emotions and how to explain divorce and how to explain death. And now, you know, I mean, just wonderful books out there. Yeah. Gee, I wish I'd known I would have made a list. I, I don't know. Well, if you still would, if you email it to um, me, I'll add it at the end of this video. Also with the other play link that you suggested, I'll put it on this video. So then when people watch this later and we can also add it to social media posts of things that you recommend if you're comfortable with that. Okay, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. I have learned so much. It's been such a pleasure. And she's the best. She's absolutely the best. No, she's the best. No, and I have to honestly say, you know, I've been to a few um, Kiwanis meetings, you know, they were gracious enough to invite me or whatever. Um, And they are the friendliest people. I mean, they are the best people. I love Kiwanians. So anyway, that's, it's a pleasure to be able to, to uh, be here. So thank you. thank you. Well, thank you both so much for your time, Mr. President. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Bye, Winnie. Can't wait to see you. See you. Bye.